the heartburn pill, the painkiller, that gentle laxative, and even some diabetes medications. Many of us take these every day for months and even years. But what we now realize is that these medications are quietly wrecking our microbiome and they're destroying our gut health. So in this video, I wanna show you how common drugs like the ones that you find in most people's medicine cabinets can reshape your gut and even worsen the very condition these drugs are meant to help. And as we go through these medications, I'll talk about safer alternatives if they exist. And if they are no good substitutes and you have to stay on these medications, I'll show you practical ways to protect your gut health while you're on them. And one important note, even though I'm a physician, I'm not your physician. So please talk to your doctor before you make any changes to your medications or supplements or your medical regimen, as this is meant to be educational only and not medical advice. So there was a large metagenomic study that was published in Nature Communications back in 2020 to look at how everyday medications change your microbiome. And what they found was out of 41 drugs that they looked at, 19 of them were linked to significant shifts across multiple cohorts. And the strongest and most consistent signals that they saw involved medications like proton pump inhibitors or PPIs and laxatives and NSAIDs like ibuprofen and even oral medications like metformin. So let's go through these. Now, now, the medication category that was the most associated with changing the microbiome was PPIs or proton pump inhibitors. And these are medications like omeprazole or pantoprazole or esomeprazole. And if you ever suffer from reflux, you will probably prescribe one of these. So these medications, they do a very good job of lowering your stomach acid, but they also damage your gut health. And for the vast majority of people, these medications are never meant to be taken long-term. And there's many things I don't like about PPIs, but in this context, the stomach acid is actually one of the things that helps keep our microbiome healthy because a less acidic GI tract changes which bacteria survive and where they settle. And in multiple cohorts, PPI users show lower microbial diversity and an unusual rise in oral bacteria, but in the stool where they're not supposed to be found. And this pattern of bacteria distribution tracks with a bigger risk of enteric infections, including C. diff colitis, which is an overgrowth of unwanted bacteria in the colon that can lead to awful diarrhea and inflammation. And what's even more concerning, this study also found broad functional shifts in people who were exposed to PPIs. So we see changes in how our bodies metabolize our bile acids, and we even see changes in our vitamin pathways. So PPIs don't just increase bad bacteria at the expense of the good bacteria. They also change the jobs these microbes perform. And the longer and higher the exposure, the larger the signal. And this is not to say do not take PPIs. We often need these medications as a necessary evil, especially if you have clear confirmed indications like erosive esophagitis or stomach ulcers, or if you have H. pylori. Well then yes, PPIs are absolutely necessary, but we always wanna make sure we take the shortest duration possible for effective treatment. And what we don't want is to use it as a chronic medication for heartburn without a time limit. So the things to discuss with your doctor would be a potential switch to another medication like H2 blockers. So that would be medications like Pepsid or to a newer class of medications like potassium competitive acid blockers like Vanoprazan. But once again, ideally for the shortest duration possible because all of these medications have their own set of side effects. And we really have to emphasize non-medications ways to fix our reflux. So we have to go to the basics of eating smaller but more frequent meals and elevating the head of the bed and being careful with alcohol or carbonated beverages. And for some people, we really need to look into food intolerances or food allergies to really parse through which foods trigger the most issues. And if all of those don't work, there's some promising naturopathic remedies that may potentially help, like aloe vera syrup. And we have a very small but a randomized controlled trial of 79 participants that showed that aloe vera syrup was comparable in treating gastroesophageal reflux disease when compared to the standard treatment with omeprazole or Zantac. And there was another interesting study that was a small randomized control trial, but of only 45 participants, that showed that freeze-dried Myrtus communis extract was just as effective at treating reflux as omeprazole. Now, both of these are tiny, tiny studies, and we would need much larger studies to see if we're able to extrapolate those findings to a large population, um, especially when it comes to safety and interactions with other medications or supplements. But all that to say is there's lots of promising options 
use that go beyond just daily PPI use that I would recommend discussing with your naturopathic doctor. Next, let's talk about your over-the-counter painkillers in a category of NSAIDs. So these would be things like ibuprofen or naproxen. So these drugs, they work well for pain and inflammation, but what's often neglected is how they quietly damage your gut. And this is what happens. NSAIDs block an enzyme called cyclooxygenase, which reduces prostaglandins. And that's how they lower inflammation, but prostaglandins also protect the lining of your stomach and your intestines. And when you strip the protection away, the gut lining becomes more permeable and more vulnerable to injury. And here's a common trap. Many people take PPIs to protect the stomach while they use NSAIDs for pain or inflammation. And while this helps the upper GI tract, this combo is associated with a deeper shift in microbiome and it leads to injury further along the gut in your lower GI tract. So we're getting pain relief, but the pain relief comes at the expense of your healthy ecosystem, which is not a good long-term trade-off. So if you need to be on NSAIDs, just like with PPIs, talk to your doctor to come up with a plan to use the lowest effective dose and for the shortest amount of time. And for localized pain, prioritize topical NSAIDs, so like creams and gels, which will help reduce your systemic exposure. And this is another area where we have to maximize our non-drug options as much as we can. So we would lean into things like physical therapy and sleep and heat therapy and ergonomic fixes. Now, let's talk about laxatives. So in this Nature Communication study, laxatives were among the strongest non-antibiotic drug signals linked to the largest shift in our gut bacteria. And we have animal studies that show that even mild osmotic diarrhea from polyethylene glycol or something like Miralax can cause long-lasting shifts in the microbiome even after the laxative is withdrawn. But the good news is constipation is usually not about missing the laxative. It's almost always about three things, your fiber, your fluids, and your movement. So let's start with fiber. Most Americans only get about 10 to 15 grams of fiber per day, when the goal really should be closer to 30 to 40 grams. Which by the way, I made a separate video on the amazing changes you can see in your body and in your mind if you eat 30 grams of fiber for 30 days. And I'm going to link to the video in the description below. But the main point here is to make sure we get fiber from many diverse sources, which includes both soluble and insoluble fiber. Where soluble fiber is the one that dissolves in water and forms a gel, and you get that from oats and apples and pears and avocados and sweet potatoes. And insoluble fiber is the one that traps and holds onto the water and helps with food transit in the intestines. So you will get your insoluble fiber from your basic salad vegetables and nuts and whole grains and brown rice. Now, after fiber, the second most important component is hydration. And if you think of fiber as a sponge, it only works if it has water to soak up. And without that, you're basically turning your intestines into concrete. So hydration is extremely important when it comes to constipation or making sure that fiber actually works for you. And last but not least is movement. And that's because your gut is also a muscle, the same way your bicep or your hamstring is a muscle. So if you sit all day, your colon does too. But the good news is even a 20 minute brisk walk after meals can go a long way in helping you kickstart your natural contractions that move things along. So before you reach for a laxative or a stool softener, try fixing these fundamentals and your gut will thank you later. Okay, let's talk about metformin. And this was a drug that was flagged in the paper as having one of the strongest microbiome signals. Now, when it comes to metformin, things get a little tricky. There are some studies that speculate that metformin may actually increase the number of beneficial bacteria, like like acromantia or other bacteria that produce your therapeutic short chain fatty acids that are so good for your gut health. But not everyone responds the same way as many people can get bloating and diarrhea when you first start metformin. And in fact, a recent systematic review of 13 studies showed that metformin use was associated with changes in some bacterial species, but those effects were not consistent across populations. And a lot of those studies actually had conflicting findings. So this is the drug that may May have benefits, but it may also have very unpredictable shifts in your microbiome. So if your doctor recommends for you to take metformin, then I would recommend starting with the lowest dose and titrating slowly. Also, make sure your doctor prescribes you the extended release formulations, which can help reduce those unwanted GI side effects. So if you're taking these medications, I would definitely talk to your doctor and revisit the why and how long you need to be on these drugs. Because one thing that I see all the time is many people were started medications like PPIs for a short-term reason and they just never got reevaluated to see if those can be stopped. 
And if you have a condition where you have to take one of these medications long term, longer than a few weeks, then I would try to reinforce and protect your gut as much as you can. So that would mean things like prioritizing getting at least 30 grams of fiber per day or more and prioritizing fermented foods that are full of probiotics and life cultures. So I would add things like kimchi or sauerkraut and tempeh or miso or kefir. Oh, and by the way, if you like Japanese food, the one superfood that I've been obsessed with recently, which is an absolute powerhouse of a probiotic is natto, which is great not just for gut health, but for inflammation and your bone health and even your cardiovascular health. And by the way, I'm actually gonna make a video on the top fiber superfoods that I personally use when I have to take these medications that disrupt your gut flora. So things like NSAIDs or PPIs or antibiotics. So stay tuned for that. All right, I hope this was helpful. Stay healthy and I'll see you in the next one.